Hello and welcome to the podcast today. We thank you for being here and we have our special guest that has not been with us for a while who's rejoining us, Miss Anne LaFleur, who is one of the original founders of uh, Bonds for the Win, both the book and the construct itself. So we look forward to uh, connecting with her today. Again, if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe and hit that button and share with others so that they can gain knowledge that you've been afforded. And thanks for joining us today. Once again, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Beth, for having me back. And it's good to be back. It's nice to see you again. Likewise, likewise. And uh, happy uh, in, in the Middle Eastern world. It's now as of uh, yesterday, a happy new year, right? And as they're starting their new uh, physical cycle. So um, it, in many ways, this is a, a kind of a fresh start. Do you realize here in France, uh, literally Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday is our holiday for the Easter. Huh. And yesterday is what they actually call Easter here in Tahiti. Good to know. Good to know. Um, yes. One of my... So it's actually celebrated yesterday, not really on Sunday. Mm, there you go. <laughs> Well, my business partner, Chris, for the channel, he's in England and he said yesterday was a holiday. So that that does make sense. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so, Ann, let's start the, uh, the podcast today with some some curs cursory information for those who don't know you, who are not familiar with what your your work entails. Can you talk about Bonds for the Win, how it got started? What was the impetus and what is its main purpose? Okay, well, Bonds for the Win came about because Mickey was having some issues with her school board and the president of the school board was actually doing some very illegal things. The children were, you know, being forced to wear masks. There was a lot of problems and Mickey's like, we can't do anything with these school boards. And I heard a video that talked about a man who actually came out and says, you know, everybody is bonded and has oath of offices and we can go after them and close them down. So I started digging into this and I found out some really interesting information that we could use at these school board meetings. And so Mickey and I started to launch the program and launch the project. And we worked in the background for quite some time to make sure we had all of our information correct. The website was built. We spoke to a lot of parents around different counties. I chose a few parents to help. And what we did is we wrote notices of intent, which means we could file or we didn't have to file, but we were putting them on notice. And we were explaining all the laws that they were breaking, international, uh, state, and federal laws that they were breaking for you know, uh, restricting our freedom of movement, forcing us to wear masks, uh, creating illegal mandates. And so once we had one parent stand up, then it started to be sort of a domino effect. And we ended up with hundreds of mama bears and papa bears and people, you know, even grandparents coming into these school board meetings and literally serving these notices to these school boards. And the school boards first ignored the notice until they literally, try, you know, contacted their insurance company. And their insurance company says, no, you're not covered for anything that is illegal in your district. And any harm that you are doing to these children or come to these children is your personal liability. So that was the key to stopping all these ma massive mandates, you know, with masks, uh, vaccines, and having all this stuff, you know, social distancing and all the crap that they put together during that time. So Bonds for the Win was actually an excellent, excellent program. And we did uncover a lot of things during Bonds for the Win, especially the LGBTQ plus plus movement, the pronouns and everything else. And we're still fighting that today. They're still not giving that up. Interesting times we're in, but uh, I do believe that the, you know, God's uh, grace and goodness will prevail over the evil. And we need people like you who are, or helping to uh, to you know champion and achieve that effect. So thank you for your work uh, and contributions thus far in the fight. So um, and can you just uh, for those who don't know who you're talking about, can you you are the architect of the engine room behind Bonds for the Win, but you also have that partner uh, Mickey. Can you just talk a little bit about her and the other half of that, please? Mickey Klein is a 
fantastic woman. She is so spiritual. She really cares about the children. She really cares about the movement. She really cares about uniting the whole world together in love and light. She is um, a fantastic person who was actually the best spokesperson in the entire world uh, to go out there and bring these parents together. She did the most fantastic videos. She did the, the best um, graphics. She, you know, put everything together in layman's terms that people could understand. She is a fantastic woman, a fantastic woman. Great. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So first question now that we've kind of talked about the anatomical grassroots structure of Bonds for the Win. Um, what, the first question I have for you, Anne, is how important is uh, contract law and trust law versus statutory trust law? How would you how would you explain the importance of that? Well, a lot of it has to deal with courts, how the courts are set up and what the law district is in my books. I don't really study too much contract law or statutory, you know, contract statutory laws or things like this. I have a little bit of a background in it, but from what I see, equity is the key to everything. So we have to get a contract and it has to be a binding contract. It has to be an equitable contract in order for us to enforce the contract. So everything that we work under today is contracts. Everything is a contract relationship between one party and another party. Even a constitution is a contractual relationship that forms a corporation, a corporation type of a contract that contracts between the people we elect into these, these offices and the people who are actually the trustees of that trust. So we have to understand the different relationships and how relationships work. It's a, it's a major study. It's very confusing if people mix them up. And it's also very confusing to the public when they're told, oh, you can do this. But when in reality, you have to go look. You're not allowed to do certain things that is pushed out there. And this is where sometimes the problems get come up with different things. Hmm. Okay. So with that in mind, um, how binding is uh, trust or contract law internationally as opposed to stateside? Oh, it's very binding. It's totally binding. So we have the universal community, uh, commercial codes. Those are for international trade. Every country runs on a contract and you must contract with this company or this country in order to pass your goods and services. So if we're looking at contract, a contracts are binding. So if I contract with you and I offer you my services and I don't fulfill the contract, you actually have the opportunity to take me to a court and make me fulfill my contract or pay my damages. And in the contract, we have to have a very binding agreement. So I do believe, and I mean, all countries are run on trust. Everything is a trust relationship. So yes, it's very important around the world that we trust one another. So this is um, something that people really need to start looking into. They start, they, they should start literally getting their own personal trust and setting up their own personal trust to protect their personal property. Yeah. So basically when that trust is broken, uh, you know, literally and figuratively, there has to be some type of remedy, right? Right. The remedy is called redress of grievances to the trustees. So you can redress your grievances in the forms that they've used for eons and eons. It goes way back to 800 BC. I've traced it way back. The people who are harmed and the trust is broken through their contract have been able to redress their grievances if the trustees of the trust who are the elected officials do not answer your grievances and do not correct the issues. You have the opportunity, which is in your contract, to abolish everything and start over again. Get people in there who will, you know, protect you and get the trustees out that are 
causing the harm and damage. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so let's piggyback off that a second hand. You were talking about everybody should have a trust. Is there any ideal, is it just a wide open net or do you think there's certain people that should have a trust more than other people? Or do you think it's just kind of an open platform uh, structure in your mind? Well, basically, I'm going to be honest with you. Anybody who owns any type of property, a car, a boat, a home, even if you don't own anything and you just have your bank account and you have just your home items in your home and you might have some, you know, pictures that you purchase that, you know, have a, a, a nice monetary value. You might have your own personal jewelry gold, silver, you might have a silver collection, a coin collection, or just something that you might not consider to be anything of value. But if you lose that and you lose your estate and they take it all away, you can find out then that it's very valuable. So my suggestion is I always start off with a revocable trust. The reason I do this is so we have a passage that goes from the private into the public. And this is our gateway. Once we can move everything out of the public into the private, using a private trust bank account, non-interest bearing, then we have, we have our foundation. And from there, we can start building our re irrevocable trust and moving certain property into an irrevocable trust that can never be touched. And they can't come after us. So I believe everybody, no matter how small their investments are. Uh, sorry about this. Hang on. Uh -oh. Hey, guys. Sorry about that. Somebody's okay. on my bridge. Sure. Uh, how small their investments are, everything is going to grow and everything should be protected. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, sounds like basically anybody who has assets of any type would be you know, an excellent candidate. And I appreciate you breaking down the difference between revocable and irrevocable, because that can be in some circles, a point of contention. Some people are very much on the revocable side. Some people are on the irrevocable side. And it, it there's more flexibility with that, like you said, because it just depends on application and what you're trying to achieve. It's a very, you know, customizable process. You need more than one trust. I'll be honest. You do need a revocable trust that you can change, alter, and move, move you know, your personal property in and out of the trust. You need re irrevocable trust that you, has property in it that you don't want it to ever use or you want to leave it to your children. And then for cars, I would not move a car into its trust by itself or a revocable or irrevocable. Cars are considered to me to be liabilities because if you're in an accident, they can come after the trust. With cars, I, I literally tell people to set up an express trust for your car and move your car into an express trust. That way you have it in a trust. Your trust will allow you to use the car and you're not causing liability to your other trust. Mm. Yeah, it lowers your, uh, lowers your liability and, and exposure, so. No, that's that's a very very important discussion that we're having. I think for a lot of people, it'll resonate this discussion. So it's good. Uh, so with that in mind, and with all that we've established and all these different touch points, what in your mind makes your uh, trust unique in comparison to the standard traditional trust most people are familiar? Okay, the reason I do the trust classes is from personal experience. My parents went out, like many people, they went out to a lawyer and they had a lawyer draft their trust. It was a revocable living trust. They thought they had done everything correctly. Well, the lawyer gives them a sheet of paper. He doesn't explain to them, look, you need to do these things. You need to move the titles. If you wanna claim this, you need to move the titles into the trust. You also need to set up a trust bank account and who is your trustee? And the trustee will run the bank account. You need to move your assets out of the public into the private, run your trust from the private, and it will be okay in the public. You can use the trust to pay any public bill or any public offering. And when my, when my parents died, what a mess that was. 
there was so many things that this lawyer who they paid $5,000 for this document uh, literally had sided with somebody who's a caretaker for my mother who literally had stolen the whole estate. And then it's like, well, you have no say so in what's happening. So this is why I'm like, no, this is ridiculous. There, there is, so, and I had been doing trust for quite some time when this took place. And so I knew what was going on when, you know, it came down to a personal experience. So basically, if you do your own trust and you understand the structure of it, what type of documents you can use to write letters from the trust to a company who's wronging or harming you as the trustee, because now you're into trust law and trust law is a higher law than civil law. So you can use trust law to rectify your problems and go after individuals or somebody who has stolen from the trust or harmed the trust. It gives you a better opportunity to understand how to operate in the private. Yeah, and what your what your true rights are as well, what options you really have. Correct. You know, it's interesting, Em, to to make sort of a not a leap, but a comparison. It's not, it's different, but it's not dissimilar to what we're seeing today societally in certain parts of the country. I'm sure you've heard about you know, the squatters and, and, you know, they're taking over people's homes when they're not there. And then they're claiming to have a lease and then the actual homeowner can get into their own home and the police are siding with the squatters. I mean, it's all upside down. And so, you know, in a, in a way it's relatable because people really need to safeguard themselves from what was the unthinkable has now become a fairly probable scenario, depending on, you know, where they are in life. You're absolutely correct. We just got done dealing with that mess too in my mother's trust. We had a squatter who moved her two daughters into my mother's house. She was only a caretaker and it was over a year. She's the one who, you know, went in and claimed all the property of my mother and moved it out before we could come and do the inventory. And like you're saying, the police are absolutely agreeing with squatters. There's tons of new laws, new amendments, new all kinds of stuff that are ridiculous. California is horrendous <laughs> to get a person out of your home. It's yes. absolutely insane. And yeah. when we tried to get her out, there was a huge rainstorm flood and they're saying, well, they're protected now until June of this year. You can't even file a claim against them for another six months. And we're just like, are you kidding me? I mean, so these governments are literally breaking their trust con contracts with the public. And this is where we need to stand up and say, okay, enough is enough. We need to start redressing our grievances to these committees. And if they don't want to do anything, I did see a video out of Michigan. There was a little tiny town in Michigan. They stood up to their uh, elected officials in Michigan. They literally refused to, you know, listen to the, to the, the people, the governed. And so what did the governed do? They mandated their own election and they voted them out. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them voted them out. Once the election was held and it came back to Nana to see they, they were all voted out. It didn't matter what the sheriff was. If he was, you know, red, white, blue, or green, he literally had to come in with the people and throw those people out of the office. And a locksmith came and changed the lock. So we do have our rights, guys. We just need to understand how we accomplish this and the quiet way to do it and the correct way to do it. Absolutely, because I was just watching a video and or an expose this weekend over this very subject you're talking about. And this guy, has, uh, he was experiencing the same problem. You know, his mother was, was ill and, and she was giving him over the house and squatter came in, very similar situation, what you were talking about. And he had to, he started forming a company to help other people because he saw this was becoming an epidemic and very problematic. And so he reverse engineered it. He, he became a squatter against the squatters and, you know, locked them out and, uh, and basically reverse engineered the system that was working against him. So uh, it's just sad that people are having to come up with such creative solutions for problems that shouldn't have existed in the first place, to your point. 
So. Well, you know, you do own the house and you're, you know, you've inherited that house. Mm -hmm. What is it to say that you can't go and move in with the squatter and squat at the house at the same time? I mean, yeah. I told my brother, move in, squat there, you know, protect, protect mom's affairs, you know, yeah. just come in and take over the home, you know, yeah. and just act like you just live there. Say, hey, I'm taking this bedroom. I'm a squatter. And move all this stuff out into the living room. Nope, you guys are going to sleep over there. And I said, there's nothing anybody can do because you're a squatter. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, again, reverse engineering, right? But I mean, you have some of these homeowners who have had to resort to making cash payments to these squatters because it's too legally expensive and time consuming to get them out. I mean, it's again, they shouldn't have to even be in this position in the first place. And uh, oh, yeah, my brother was told he should give her $5,000 to leave the home. And I'm like, no, you're not giving anybody anything. She should never have been there after mom died. Right. You know, she was only a caretaker. Right, exactly. But, um, you know, I, we're seeing crazy things right now, but I think that we're going to see all this stuff unwind and get our, get God's country and, and our world back into a sense of, uh, of, I don't say normalcy, because we'll never see the old normal again, but thankfully, because it wasn't always as great as we thought it was, but we're going to just right size this whole thing and, and unwind all this corruption, or at least a great, you know, majority of it, right? And people like you are helping to do that. Um, so positioning with our last few minutes, Anne, um, what, what's something we always typically talk about in our shows with you and with others, um, looking at the global reset now, we see the entirety of the world basically falling apart. We see the BRICS amalgamating. I think there's a total of 81 countries now getting ready to come on board, you know, in the entirety to the BRICS and de-dollarize because everybody's tired of, of the U.S. hegemony for obvious reasons. Um, where do you see things in your purview of experience with the reset? And what pivotal role in your mind does Israel play as part of this? Israel is so corrupt and so bad. Uh, Israel, I mean, I'm being honest, when they created Israel and right after the war or just before the war, you know, the Second World War, and they created this country, uh, it was a safe haven for anybody who wanted to go over there. And I mean, most of them, what they're calling are Kazarian Jews or Kazarian mafia. And so, I mean, they created a country for mafia, which really was sad to me because there really is a lot of people out there who are Jewish, who really honor their heritage and their religion, and they're very strict about it. So to see somebody mock their religion was very sad to me to see this. And Israel has got to come down. And the real people who are the real religion have got to stand up and fight for their, their religious beliefs. Because they did always say the Jews were God's chosen children. But I don't think God chooses just one child. I honestly don't. God chooses all of his children. And everybody is equal in God's eyes. And there's not anybody of any race, religion, or color that God doesn't love. Because God is in your heart. And if you love others, God is loving you at the same time. So yes, all of this that is not related to anything that is spiritual will be coming down because I do see this is actually the end times. When I was a kid and they talked about it, I never believed I would be here to see this. I thought it would be in 200 years from now. I, I was sort of wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're... Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're definitely seeing things happen. And, and, you know, to your point, Israel is a pivotal moment because we believe on our camp that uh, it's our contention to really be watching Israel because they're going to make the grave mistake against uh, Iran with the secret nu nuclear power plants. You're already seeing them start to bomb certain, you know, hospitals and, you know, government buildings, villages, whatnot. And it's right. There's 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 the side that the mainstream positions right out of traditional programming. And then there's the other side that uh, truthers and patriots like us know is really going on that things are not what they seem to be right that there's a deeper purpose you know for that in other words 
And so I'm watching, you know, like you and I think many people, the eclipse next week, the solar eclipse and the importance of that, because there's going to be actually a, a, it's a blood red moon in Israel, which typically symbolizes judgment. And then we have the 22nd coming up, which is Passover in just a few weeks. And uh, I had SGN on on yesterday and he said that he would be surprised if we didn't see some activity with regards to what's going on in Israel with the red heifers and whatnot, uh, you know, prior to Passover. And then you have Sudani going over to Prime Minister Sudani of Iraq going over to, uh, you know, D.C. Uh, meeting with whoever he's meeting with, which is, you know, an issue, a w- a debate within itself. Right. And then uh, he's coming back and all this activity is going on this month. So this seems to be, from what we can see, a very pivotal month in terms of transition and turning points. Would you agree? Oh, I definitely agree because. Literally, I've been watching the map of the eclipse, and we know the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. So how is this, how is this eclipse really honestly coming about? Because I see it going, you know, like coming up from the south and just passing over, going like almost in a northerly direction. I never knew the sun came from the south and went to the north. So is this really a split of timelines, a split of reality? Are we actually w- witnessing what has passed and what could come? It's so insane. I mean, there's so many different, you know, variables and so many different things that we're seeing. And I just think that this is a time of reckoning. And the evil, it, the evil is showing itself so much right now. And it's so provident. And we can just, you know, feel the evil around us that we know that they're running, they're scared because we no longer are giving our energy to them before the evil was hidden because we gave our energy to them. Once we take back our life energy and we don't focus on them anymore, that brings them out in the open and that's when they're exposing themselves. So I do believe we are in a time of reckoning and I don't know, I'm not really so much into the Bible, but I'm, you know, more spiritually in other aspects of my life. Mm -hmm. And I just believe the, the end will not be for all. There will be some people that choose to, I hate to say it, check out ahead of time. You know, the strong will survive. And hopefully the strong will be able to hand it, to bring the meek and the mild with them to allow them to become strong at the same time. That's all I'm hoping that we're here to comfort and bring the, the people that are going to suffer the most from this reckoning and this exposure. We're here to help them. And what I consider them is the weak and mild. And we need to open our arms and embrace them and bring them with us because we don't want to leave anybody behind. We don't want anybody to be, you know, engulfed by evil in their lives. That's how I see it. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that's kind of why we're doing this, right, Anne, is to, to take along as many, many of the, whether you're a Christian or not, if you, your intentions are pure and you are on the right side of, you want to be on the right side of history. We want to, we want to be a part of that equation to help minimize the collateral damage. We can't, you know, contain it hundred percent, obviously, but we can, we can make a dent and we can do our part to contribute to the betterment of, of humanity, which, you know, God commands us to love one another, like you rightly said. So it's all part of the same equation at the end of the day. It's just a matter of, you know, your priorities and what you're focusing on. And so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, so with that all in mind, just to kind of go back to our the original question, um, now that you've explained how you see Israel factoring into this, um, would you say that we're zeroing in on the target of getting some closure with regards to the global reset? I actually believe we are. I believe we're closer than we actually realize. Hmm. Uh, I am part of the global humanitarian project for the South Pacific. And I get reports from this constantly. I get updates from it. And I do realize, you know, our company is the largest humanitarian project right now on the planet. 
And I know that we, you know, we have, you know, uh, all humanitarian projects have been funded. But the problem is until we clean up the mess, nothing can be released. And so we keep getting reports on a daily basis of how much closer and closer we are. I do believe we are, you know, at the finish line. And I do believe, you know, from the reports I'm getting and seeing and receiving that all things are coming to an end. The new year is starting and the new life is beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that sentiment. Uh, before we go to our last question, just to tie up something that you said, I thought you said a lot of important points. But one thing that struck me is you talked about, you know, the sun rising in the east, uh, setting in the east and coming out in the west. Uh, and it got me thinking that, you know, this is an east west reset for those who, I mean, many know that, but for those who may not be aware, uh, what we're seeing is the wealth of the wicked being laid up for the righteous. So we're seeing the west who has, you know, hamstrung the entirety of the world with the dollar and the hegemony of all that central bank and interest uh, unconstitutional nonsense uh, being wrested away and all the, the wealth is now going to the you know to the eastern countries uh, you know obviously the Middle East and China and Russia and Africa and many South Africa and many other nations uh, so it, it, it's it's truly I think a proliferation to your point that's coming full circle so I just thought that was an interesting sort mm -hmm. of sub point that you made um, <laughs> <laughs> so last question for today, Anne, because I know you got things to do, uh, is you and I were talking offline about this year's elections and how uh, in the past many people, you know, would choose not to vote because they felt their vote didn't count and, uh, the, you know, the good and bad ramifications of that. Do you think there will be an election this year or do you see a different outcome? The people have got to... I mean, if all goes well, I mean, this is my prediction. If all goes well and we're able to take down the corruption in all governments around the world, I honestly believe that all people of the world are going to say, why in the world are we having all of these people control us? I mean, do we actually need that much government control? I honestly believe that these people and these countries around the world the people are going to stand up and say, hey, okay, we don't need that person. We don't need this person. We don't need that committee. We don't need this bureau. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. We're getting rid of all that. What we want is we want a legislative, we want an executive, and we want a judicial branch. Here's how we want it structured. And this is how many people our government is going to be limited to. And each state is going to stand up and they're going to literally abolish most of these offices. And I do believe they have to get rid of all these people, get rid of what they've done, get rid of all these you know, add-ons that they keep adding on to the government and creating, because who literally gave them permission to create all this stuff? I mean, they never asked us, they just showed it to us. And it's just like, okay, here it is. Now you get accept it because now we're using it. Same with facial recognition, if you wanna get on an international air, airplane i went to you know los angeles to come home and here i'm stuck with a full body scan and i'm just like what is this you know I, I mean i hadn't been there in six years and then to get on my plane they stuck me over at some terminal way the hell out in the middle of nowhere and the whole terminal was facial recognition terminal and you literally had to scan your ticket onto a screen a screen at the at the back end and look into the monitor so it would open a door so you could get on your plane. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This has got to go. So these are the things that I think people are going to wake up and recognize. And they're going to restructure their whole government officials and recreate their trust and reelect their trustees to take care of them. And I do believe the, the people who will be electing I would say only 20% of what's already there. <laughs> yeah. On a good day. <laughs> On a good yeah. Day. I mean, that's about, I mean, we really need to consolidate this overreach. We really do. Well, and yeah. I think people are going to wake up to it. And I think they're going to abolish 90% or 80% of 
these government officials and offices and everything that are unnecessary because we are the governed and we are the ones who created it and we are the ones who control it. And the trustees are the ones that are supposed to take care of us and take care of the trust of our state. And we need to self-govern, as you said, you know, we need to get back the reins and get more involved and not have such a passive mentality about government and that it's somebody else's job. No, it's our job. They work for us, not the other way around. And we have to take that authority back to your point. You know, you look at uh, Spain and, and, you know, France and Ireland and, you know, even England, all these countries, the farmers are standing up vehemently and saying, no, we're not doing this. And you had, you know, Javier Malay in Argentina, the president there, fire was it 70,000 government workers so you're seeing this, yeah. this this wave of proliferation to your point you know taking place where you know the people and even the correct leaders are starting to step up and make a very you know strong declaration about how things are going to be going forward so yeah it's a, it's a, it's a good point so I so. think it's going to be a beautiful revelation I really do I don't believe everybody is going to understand it right away I also believe there's going to be a few groups that are going to stand up to lead the charge and literally abolish or, you know, abolish the people who are sitting in office that are harming us. And once they can get the people out and start this, they have the best chance because I went through 50 states constitutions, all 50 states. And in every single one of the states constitutions, it says the people created the governments. The governments work for the people. We are the governed. We control them. They don't control us. Mm -hmm. If anything becomes ty tyrannical or inappropriate or they overstep their bounds, as a collective, a collective of people, we have the right to abolish our governments and reestablish a government that is in, that will protect the people. So we have the means you guys we just need to understand how it works and that is all in history and how our forefathers redressed all of these issues and got it all straightened out absolutely well thanks ann again for your time we're really honored to have you we look forward to having you again shortly um where can people find out about your work and any last minute thoughts you have for the audience today well I usually work through the Fearless Floyd Show and it's called the fearlessfloydshow.com. He's on Telegram, he's on YouTube, he has YouTube videos and he has a website. And on the website, you can find uh, my trust classes, my trust books and things like this uh, on his Telegram channel and on his uh, YouTube, you can find the free trust uh, videos Floyd and I did together. And it really showcases a lot of the work that we've done together. Great. Okay. Uh, excellent. We'll put that link in the description. And folks, again, uh, to contribute to the backs of what Ann was talking about, this is why we have created, uh, primarily Chris has created clubpatriot.com, is to galvanize patriots and like-minded uh, thinkers throughout the world, not just limited to America. Uh, patriotism, nationalism is a state of mind and not governed by boundaries. So um, the clubpatriot.com has a free section where you can all get together, much like Discord, share ideas, opinions, solutions, whatever. Just have a free and open exchange of, of ideas that uh, the mainstream channels will not block. It's going to be commercial free. So that'd be really nice. And then if you, if you are interested in you know, creating streams of income or uh, connecting with other business owners for, like Ann said, whatever, humanitarian projects, or you have a patent or something, or uh, you want to partner with a, a business owner who's a little further ahead than you, uh, and they can help you move your, your vision a little bit faster or create a channel partnership, for example, um, that part is a separate brain within Club Patriot that you can access. Um, and we'll leave that link in the description. Again, Ann, thanks for being here. Uh, we look forward to having you again in the near future. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was really nice to talk to you again. You as well. Take care. Okay, you too.